Hey, welcome to our show. I'm your host, Tyler Coe, and I'm excited to have you here, no matter how you got here. We do our show live on Twitch every single week, and you can also watch recorded versions on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, and iTunes, and I think a few others. All links are in the description below, and as always, please subscribe. And with that, let's start the show. So how are we today, everyone? I am so excited to have you all here. As you can tell, I'm probably a little too excited, a little anxious, because this is my first ever episode of this show. Um, And this is a show and a program that aims to educate, enlighten, uplift, all that positive stuff, but most importantly, to help. That is the goal, is to help everybody, including myself. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder early on in my life, and my journey in dealing with that has taken me to so many different places. And those of you that suffer from a disorder or know somebody that does, uh, you know it's a battle. But I'm going to tell you, and the people that we have on the show are going to tell you, that it's a battle worth fighting, okay? Our afflictions do not have to be a death sentence. Um, They don't have to be a prison. And on this show, we plan to discuss... Uh, the best ways to live towards a more healthy, productive, uh, and happy life. Because it's possible. It really is. And it's something that can be accomplished together because it's us. It's we. Uh, And while I'm going to be talking about my experiences uh, and sharing my opinions on the show, um, I'm actually going to be in the audience with you guys. Because it's not my show, okay? It's not about me. It's about us. So I'm going to be in the crowd learning and getting frustrated and crying um, and trying to figure out becoming the best version I can of dealing with my mental illness because I very much believe in the saying that you are not obligated to stay the person that you were yesterday or a week ago or a year ago um, or your whole life. You can decide to change into the person that you want to be right now. And I also believe when it comes to mental health, it's not necessarily true. You know, so many of us uh, feel very trapped. Um, We feel lost. We confuse, confused, and and frankly, we just have no freaking idea how to even begin to address the problems that we suffer or that somebody else has suffered. And man, when you are in the dark, it is so impossible to have hope. But I'm, I, I, it is my belief, and I wish I was hooked up to a polygraph uh, machine right now, truth serum in my veins, because I'm going to tell you the truth that there are people that are looking for you in the dark and they're trying to find you so they can help. So we got to find each other. That's what this whole thing is all about because these people can light up your world with change. And I know that right now it's never been tougher to get help. It's so important to get help right now. And it is so easy to stay on that mat, right? All of us have been down there. I have residencies down there. Everyone down there knows my name. It is so easy to live down there, but we can't live down there. We can't stay down there. And if you've made a choice to not, I think you're on this program. Thank you for joining us. So um, the best way for all of us to kind of pick each other up and get forward and move forward. And I know you guys are probably going to begrudgingly agree with this, but the fastest way to get anywhere is baby steps. So uh, I mentioned the show is going to be educational, right, chat? I absolutely did. So you guys have homework. Episode one, right out of the gate. We're going back to school, baby. You got homework on this program and your homework that I expect to bring, uh, you to bring back to me next week are what baby steps could you be taking right now to better your mental health? They don't have to be anything uh, too large, again, very small, but what are some things that you could be working on um, to make that a better process? Begin to plant seeds inside your head of, you know, maybe I could talk to this family member that I never had, or maybe I could start researching therapists in my area. Maybe I could just even buddy up to addressing my problems, not letting it freak me out, but just something that I can maybe even approach just a little bit. So I want to know what those baby steps are. So please come back next week and tell me what they are. I'm actually going to tell you at the end of this show, um, what my baby steps are going to be. Um, So with that, let's jump into uh, today's show topic. So every single one of us deals with mental health. Every single one of you deals with mental health. And here in America, half of all Americans will be diagnosed with a mental illness in their lifetime. And out of that group, less than half are going to be getting help. In fact, in 2019, NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Health Institute, which we're actually, 
we might have some other people on this show, um, is that they reported out of the 51.5 million people that were diagnosed with a mental illness, less than 44% got help. 43.8 to be exact. So guys, do the math. Those are the people that were reported that didn't get help. Think about the other people that weren't even diagnosed. So no matter if it's you, no matter if it's me, it is the whole planet that deals with mental health. And we always have. The struggles of mental health and the stigmas of the mentally ill goes back to the dawn of mankind. Because we as human beings are a cautious species, right? We are afraid of the unknown. We don't like that because I don't understand it. And ancient people who might have suffered from OCD or anxiety were labeled as like lunatics or mad. Like, uh, there goes Leopold rearranging his cobblestones 24-7. What the heck is that guy doing? We should throw him in the river, right? Because he's probably a witch. He he just doesn't understand. Leopold had extreme OCD. He didn't have any outlet. He didn't have any help. And he had nobody that could understand. Bipolar people, schizophrenics, borderline personality disorder, labeled as evil, as villains, monsters. And it's just that people don't understand. And to some extent, people still don't understand. Because it basically boils down to two things for me, guys. How to communicate with the world so they understand us. And then how to address our issues properly. Because I think that's the biggest problem. Because we've made big strides in the, in the past couple of years, right? Like people are beginning to share their afflictions. You know, your mom, your dad, uh, that buddy you bumped into who you went to high school with. Everybody's sharing their afflictions, which is awesome. But I think where we're still very much lacking and frustratingly so is what do we do after step one? We know something's wrong with us, right? Something's wrong with us. Uh, we know we need to get help. But when we gaze up at you know, uh, our options, it's this huge, terrifying, expansive maze of what are the right treatments? Uh, what are the right therapies? Um, what, what, what do I need to do with medication? Do I have this? Do I have that? Do I have both? Why am I getting conflicting reports? Why are my therapists not getting back with me? Oh my gosh, this is too overwhelming. I'm just going to stick with the suffering because at least I know it's familiar. It's the devil you know, then the devil you don't, right? All of us have been there. We know that. And here's another fact to consider that the average delay between onset and diagnosis and then treatment of a mental illness is 11 years. I told you guys I was bipolar. I was diagnosed when I was around 12 or 13. I didn't start getting help until I was like 25, 26. And the reason was a horrible start. I had therapists that were extremely dismissive that gave me depression at first. They couldn't even entertain the idea that it could be something else put me on a generic antidepressant, almost like doctors back in the day with cocaine, like, hey, your knee hurts, take cocaine. And let me go on my way. Hated the meds, messed me up, stopped taking them. And I hated the way that they made me feel. So then I began what all of you are so familiar with. Um, I began mastering the skill of masking my emotions with a chameleon-like persona and then substance abuse. It's a tale as old as time. Y'all know it all too well. Some of you might be going through that right now. So with this show and with this episode, um, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to take baby steps. We're going to figure out how to get people started off in the right direction, getting the right treatments, uh, the right therapists, and making it better to hop into this thing instead of it being so fearful. So with that spiel, and set up, I want to welcome on my very first guest, which I'm so excited to have, is uh, my friend Marcy, who is a health professional specialist in the Department of uh, Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And she is a clinical therapist serving both inpatients and outpatients through advocacy and consultation. So please, you guys give it up to my very good friend, Marcy. Marcy, how are we doing today? Hold on. Hold on, Marcy. Wait a second. We're still, you know, it's my first show. I got to figure things out. Let me go ahead and have you unmute yourself. And then I'm going to unmute you as well. And now I believe we can probably hear each other. Am I good now? Chat, is she good to go? I think you are, Marcy. How are we today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today to kind of talk about this and I know you and I have had this conversation multiple times because it kind of is where it all goes back to is the beginning is like, how do I start to process all of these things? Where do I start with my medication? What therapist do I start with? 
Um, so right off the bat, I want to ask you a very important question. How do I know what's wrong with me? Yeah, and you probably won't know what's wrong with you because you did not go to school to know that. Um, so that is number one. Do not self-diagnose. Do not get too much into um, Google and trying to figure out what you have and what you should do. Um, I think the biggest thing is just recognizing, hey, there's something not right here. I can't get through my day in a functional way or I'm not feeling as good as I could be. Uh, and then to seek treatment or to, first of all, before seeking treatment is just to seek an evaluation and talk to somebody um, and kind of start that conversation with a health professional. So, and, and another thing is, is it doesn't even have to be going straight to a therapist or to a psychiatrist. Cause as you just said, that's, that's, you know, a land that a lot of people haven't even seen or touched or experienced yet. It could be as simple as starting with um, your general practitioner or um, just your, for us women, for your OBGYN, somebody that you see on a regular basis and you trust. It could just be starting with them as a health professional, or it could be just starting with somebody you trust, health professional or not, a friend, um, a colleague. Um, a mentor, somebody at church, whatever it might be. But that first step is really just recognizing, hmm, I think there's something off here um, and I should probably figure out, get help figuring out what that might be. Which is that it's that tough place to start, right? Kind of admitting that problem and what do I need to do? So like, all right, so we've addressed that, right? I have an issue and you just gave us a bunch of different avenues. You know, in your opinion, depending upon the situation, what is probably the safest place to start? Because, you know, those were that was kind of one of the uh, pitfalls that I fell into is that going to a, a psychiatrist right away and just getting put on medication before I got the opinions that I probably should have gotten to go along with it. Honestly, I think so. I work um, in a medical institute. So I work with psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, social workers. I work with kind of a lot of different um, types of clinicians. And I would say really starting with your general practitioner, if you have one, um, the health professional, the doctor that you trust the most and asking their recommendation of if they have somebody that they recommend. And depending on what the issues you're feeling are or the feelings you're feeling, um, you know, it, it's on a spectrum. So if it's pretty severe, then the immediate response is going to be different than I'm just feeling really tired, anxious, just not really feeling myself throughout the day. So those answers are going to be very different. And I think that's different for parents, right? Because I think that's one of the most difficult things. And that's something we're going to talk about on the show is talking to mom and dad. And I, that was pretty much my scenario is that how do I know that my kid is just going through puberty, going through hormones, or is there something deeper? And I know, Marcy, that is a conversation that you have on a daily basis with parents, because let's be frank, and I'm not trying to be harsh right here. One of the biggest roadblocks are adults is mm -hmm. sometimes parents don't believe it. I don't believe in medication. I don't think there's a problem. Um, kind of talk us through that. Like, what are those conversations usually like and what do you hope they actually end up as? Yeah. You know, we can sit here and talk about barriers until we're blue in the face. Um, they can be cultural barriers. They can be generational barriers. They can be barriers, financial barriers, transportation, whatever it might be. That case is kind of what you were talking about the baby steps. As long as there's baby steps, even the smallest baby steps being moved forward, it means that that child hopefully is not moving backwards. Um, so I think it is this matter of talking to the parents of let's, let's be safe rather than sorry here. Let's just check. Let's speak with a professional um, and see if there's anything we can do. I think our culture is very reactive. You hear about these, you know, adults and even kids that don't go to the doctor and get their physical for years and years and years. And then they finally go because they're physically not well. Well, if they had just been going to the doctor uh, for their physical every year in a preventative manner, um, then maybe some of those problems could have been caught. So we can really translate that thinking over to mental health as well. So 
when you go take your child to a pediatrician, they really should be checking in on mental health questions as well. At our hospital that I work at, it's a children's hospital. We do a suicide um, screen on every kid that comes through our ER above a certain age. Um, Because we want to just know, just in case, they might have fallen out of a tree, but we need to make sure these other things aren't happening as well. So I think working with parents, it's it. I use that term a lot of, you know what, let's just be safe rather than sorry. If everything's good and if everything comes back well, then that's amazing. And let's check again in a year or two, but let's just make sure. That's really good. I've never even really thought about that aspect as far as checking with kids. And that's awesome to hear that that's a thing that is is happening right now. I wish I had had that when I was younger. Um, and I think that's a good rule of thumb. It kind of goes back to what I was talking about is that the, that average age of delay with mental health where you don't take care of it for a decade. And that's yeah. such a big detriment because we can fix those things earlier. Like you were talking about, man, what a better place this would be for all of us and for your mental health. Um, you know, something also like kind of going into therapists and talking about taking that step, if you will, because I think for most of us, most of us, it's not as taboo anymore. Most people are kind of going that way, comfortable with having a therapist. And during COVID, you know, there's been virtual ones and apps that you can use. Um, but you and I have talked about this before. Finding a therapist is like dating. It is not just like, oh, I showed up to this one and I picked them and I guess this is who I'm stuck with forever. Like, it's not like that at all. Like there's missed phone <laughs> calls, there's miscommunication, there's having to try it all out. Um, do you have any advice as far as like people trying to find the right fit for them? Yeah, I think um, I think kind of like you stated, it's like dating. Um, so don't get discouraged if the first person you don't feel like you mesh with. I, I remember the first time I was fired as a therapist um, in early on in my career. And yeah, it was heartbreaking to me, but in the end, it wasn't a right fit for either one of us. And it really, and since then I've been fired other times. <laughs> um, you say, but you say it, fired it, as like you're, you and the client are no longer. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Correct. Gotcha. Sorry, not not from my job, but from the from the patient where they say, you know, this isn't a good match. Um, and so and I think it has to be this mutual. This works. You know, I can communicate with you. We trust each other. Um, I trust you as the patient that you're going to go do the work and come back the next week and we're going to continue moving forward. Um, so I, I yeah. And I think taking um, notes, you know, just in your head or on a piece of paper of what worked and what didn't work with this first therapist I saw and then apply that to the next one. Maybe there was something specific you really didn't like about that first therapist. Go ahead and screen the second one when you first have a phone call before you even pay to go have um, a session with them. And so I think my biggest advice for that is just don't get discouraged because I think a lot of people, they see a therapist, it doesn't work out and they're like, okay, therapy doesn't work for me. But therapy is really about that human connection also. And so it has to, that connection has to work for therapy to be able to work. Did you guys write that down? Listeners and watchers, <laughs> take notes when you're going to see your therapist. I've never even thought about that. I think the idea of you know, following up with a call is really good too. Cause I, I have done exactly, oh, I've done all the bad things you're supposed to do in finding and, you know, in my journey in mental health is I've done that exact thing is that I've gone to a therapist. I hated it. Well, I'm done. I'm done. And now I'm done for years and I'm not going to deal with my issues at all because I hated that one instance. And like you said, you can't give up and you have to keep going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think it is worth noting though, and I'm, you know, I'm learning as I go along, like everybody else on the show, but there's different levels of therapists, correct? As far as like background and pedigree. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that for us? Yeah, correct. So when you think of like going to a doctor, um, or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, for the most part, there's just kind of that one licensing board for those different types of professions. Um, with therapy, there's a lot. So you kind of can look at it. Well, first of all, looking at the difference between psychiatry and psychology. Um, so psychiatry is an MD and they are the ones that prescribe the medicine. They can do therapy as well, but they are the only, as an MD, they can prescribe the medicine. And then you look at the psychology end of things and you have a psychologist. So that is a PhD or a doctoral level. They could also be a PsyD. 
um, level psychologist who is also a therapist. And then you come down to the master's level. So you have licensed professional counselors, licensed marriage and family therapists. I'm here in Texas. So those are what our um, licenses are called. In other states, they might be something else. Social workers also do therapy. Um, and then there's this other side that is not regulated at all called life coaches. And I do, I am not here to talk badly about life coaches, but it is to note when you see that somebody is a life coach that they are not regulated by anyone. So you just want to be kind of mindful of that um, and kind of know those letters after a therapist's name. Look them up. Um, you know, my, my family jokes that I have an alphabet after my name, but I earned each one of those letters after my name <laughs> and took um, lots of exams for them. So, yeah, I think doing the research and knowing who you're seeing. And then also a big thing is knowing what kind of therapy that they practice. Um, you know, in my in my graduate program, I learned so many different kind of theoretical basis is what we call them of different types of therapy. And what I landed on and decided on and what my uh, medical institution really pushes forward is evidence-based practices. And so what that means is that we know that these um, types of therapy work because they've actually been empirically researched. And so there are, so that's a, another great question you can ask your therapist is what kind of therapy do you practice? Do you do evidence-based practices? Do you not? Um, what does that look like for you? So that's another thing. I know a lot of information. And so, um, yeah. Well, no, that is the goal on this show is to get as much information. And I've already picked up some gems. You know, those are things I've never thought to ask. I think a lot of us, when you walk into a therapist's um, office, and you see a plaque on the wall, you're like, I guess they're qualified, but I don't know if I've ever checked once with any therapist I've ever seen to see what their actual qualifications are. Um, so that's really good advice uh, to give right there. Um, I also think it's worth noting, you know, we've discussed before in the past that there's there's so many different types of therapies that you can go to, and you kind of already alluded to that, but it doesn't necessarily just have to be one-on-one. -on -one. There's group therapy. There's also, you know, mm -hmm. more extensive levels of therapy like IOP. Um, for somebody who's looking to get into something like group therapy, what would your advice be for that? Yeah. And again, group therapy is also a relationship, so it has to work for you. So if you go to a session of group therapy and it doesn't work, well, that's also part of group therapy is working through that system of that group. But if it doesn't work, it shouldn't be making you worse. Um, so that's another thing where maybe a different group would work better for you. Uh, but yes, group therapy is definitely great. It's um, great for certain things, not as great for other things. So yeah, no, I think researching it, again, researching the institution that is hosting the group, um, looking at their rules, there's things called open groups versus closed groups, where open groups are kind of a revolving door where new members can join, some kind of fall off, maybe they discharge from the group, as where a closed group is they go ahead and put that group together at the beginning and nobody else can join throughout um, throughout the evolution of that therapy group. So I think just my main piece of advice is really to make sure you know what you're signing up for and ask questions. Don't feel like because the therapist or this clinic is the um, expert in this field that your questions are not valid because they are. And I honestly am very impressed when a parent comes in and asks me questions right off the bat or a, or a patient, um, because then I know that they're also invested and I know that they're going to be a really great patient and work hard as well. That's awesome right there. That is a, that's a sound bite. I'm definitely chopping that up and putting it out there. That was awesome, Marcy. Thank you for that. That's encouraging to hear too. And I think that's something all this can relate to. Even if we go into the doctor, kind of like you're talking about before, like I'd never want to tell my doctor everything. I don't like admitting to them my past sins or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's good to know. And folks, for folks watching and listening, having courage to do that, your doctors want that. Marcy wants that. The people in her field want that. So please exercise that. Um, 
Marcy, that was excellent. I think that gave us a really good start, uh, some really good information for our viewers to dive into. But I got to ask, I, I think we, we should have you back on the show. Um, I think it'd be awesome for you to stop by now and then whenever you have time. I know you have a very busy life, but we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. All right. We'll talk to you later, Marcy. Everybody say bye to Marcy. They're saying bye to you right now. <laughs> bye, y'all. See ya. Wow. That was good. That was good. I didn't know how, how great uh, that was going to go because the first interview tech and whatnot, but I know that was a little snippet, but Marcy is so good um, at those little bits of advice that kind of just stick with you. So, you know, I see chat kind of popping off right now. I'm going to bring back like the alert box um, or I'm going to try to, I don't know why I can't. Oh, oh gosh, we're having tech issues. Hold on. Hold on, folks. All right, we'll see. You guys in chat still hear me and everything? Oh, we're good now. We're fine. Goodness. Well, thank God that happened after the interview. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Let me see if I can turn it back. There we go. OBS was just a little slow. We're fine. Um... So yeah, what did you guys think about uh, what you guys think about Marcy? I, I'd love to get some feedback on some of the stuff she talked about. Um, I think that last bit that she talked about is really important because that's something we're all terrible at, right? Is asking for help from the people that are trying to help us, but we don't want to reveal it all. We don't want to hurt feelings, so we get stuck with the wrong therapies. We get stuck with the wrong medications and the wrong treatments. I've have been going through that my entire life until I found the good folks. Um, So yeah, loving you guys participating on chat. Um, yeah, Marcy is she's just so unbelievably great, uh, and she has a true passion for this. You know, the first time we sat down to talk about it, I think we went for like two and a half hours, and it was supposed to be like a quick ten minute coffee. Um, she's super passionate about getting parents and kids connected as far as like right treatment plans, which I think is so essential to what we're trying to figure out, guys. As a larger conversation, is that. If we can get people started off better at a younger age, man, think about what we can do with homelessness and school shootings and anger and violence towards men and women. It can change if we start helping people earlier. So, um, and again, I think the biggest rule of thumb, and I'm, I'm glad that she was our first interview to say this, is you have to do your own research. You have to research. You need to research what she said, that all the information that you, you get, you got to do your due diligence and making sure that it's accurate and that it works for you. Oh, man. That was good. And, you know, I saw a lot of you guys in the chat while I was talking to Marcy, talking about online therapy. And I know that's kind of mixed reviews on that. I think if it's, and I think she mentioned this, if it's working for you, then it's working. And I think that's the most important thing that I found with the therapists that I've had and the uh, group therapy that I've done, uh, which I, I'll talk about more on this program. Um, it worked for me. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't work for somebody else. It's not about that. It's about how you are working your process. Um, and yeah, there's another unfortunate fact. I saw some of you guys talking about you don't have a lot of therapists in your area. That, that's something that, at least here in America, there's kind of an issue. Um, I believe the stat is less than 55% of all counties in America have more than one therapist. So that does make it difficult uh, for some people who are looking to get help, right? Um, to, you know, you don't have a lot of options. It, it's, you don't want to get stuck with just the one person. Um, so maybe online would be a better way to go about it. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad that you guys are continuing the conversation. Um, and it's a lot of good info right there. And just to hear it from somebody like me is one thing, but I, I think it's really important to hear from other people who are um, successful on their own right, have their own success stories. I'll tell you guys a little bit, I'll tell you guys a little story before I bring on our next uh, very, very special guest um, who I need a text right now to make sure that she uh, hops on. Um, so back to what I was saying, what was I talking about? Oh yes. Um, that it's important to kind of give people hope and see hope. So when I, I had, have had issues with substance abuse pretty much my whole life. 
And um, my therapist um, put me on a path to saying, hey, why don't you go check out AA? And for anybody that's ever done AA, um, it's not necessarily a thing that you have to have an issue with alcohol or a substance abuse. AA can just be a really good place to find some really good people, have some conversations and be self-reflective. And the very first AA meeting that I ever went to was <laughs> the dingiest, old, like you could smell the cigarettes on the wall, the peeling wallpaper, just old gray men with the yellow beards in this dimly lit room that was stuck in the 70s. And I was like, oh my God, is this going to be the rest of my life? Is this what help is going to look like for me? Because I thought, again, kind of like we're having with this whole conversation, um, that, that that's my one option. So that's it. And I left, didn't go back, struggled with it a lot. And then I finally, uh, finally found another place that, um, thank you, Fish Schmeller, for joining the show, that was this bright, airy church. And I'm not a religious person, but it doesn't really matter. And for anybody looking to get into AA, I think that's just one of those bridges you have to cross. If you are not a religious person, a lot of it is built on that. But take it from me, who's that's not my life. It was fine. Um, but it was a room full of people, more importantly, from all walks of life, all different sexualities, all different race, and all of them had different stories about how, where their life was now. And so many of them were successful. So many of them were happy. And people you look at like, dude, you, you, you're an alcoholic? No way. The life you live and what you're talking about, it's incredible. So I think giving people hope and, and letting you guys know and myself know and reinforcing it that there are so many other people going through the same thing that we are, big and small. And a lot of people that you didn't think are going through something. I think it's important to hear from them. That even though they're smiling and they're happy and they, they put on a show or they make you feel good, that they're still hurting too. And it's a good reminder for us all. Thank you, Drunk Dino, Dino97 for following. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm seeing somebody. This is important. Uh, uh, is there a non-religious AA alternative? Yes, there is. I do not remember the name of it, but I do remember looking that up once. And yes, there are non-religious AA alternatives. But I'll tell you, even with my experience, and again, uh, good practice right here. This was my experience, you know, that little disclaimer, mine. Um, the religious aspect really wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, wasn't really pressed on me. Uh, you know, the people uh, I was involved with, at least my sponsor at the time. And again, I'm trying to keep this as anonymous as possible uh, without giving it away. But like, uh, it, it was not forced for me. I don't know if that's the case with other groups. Other groups are pretty tight in the way that they do things. So again, it's kind of just going around. But I will tell you this about a, there's not one damn meeting across the country that you're not welcome in. You can go wherever. There are groups and sites everywhere. Their organization is very well connected. Um, so I, I definitely think that's a good outlet for anybody. And, you know, just something to go check out. I think it's always, um, it's always good to go check out those things. Um, all right. So with all that said, and just here in the chat, just kind of reading a few comments before we bring on our next guest who I know you guys, uh, know all about who I'm going to put on here in just a second. Um, yeah, let's talk about that more after the show. We can talk a little bit more about some of the type of groups that you can go find, but right now I want to bring on a very special friend who I will let you folks know is battling illness tonight to come on and be with us. Um, and I'm so happy that she is. So everybody give it up for Miss Meg Turney. <laughs> Meg, I think you're, I still think you're muted on your end. Oh, am I? <laughs> nope. Not anymore. You're good to oh, go. Okay. <laughs> Buddy, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm good. I got my Powerade. I got a backup Powerade. <laughs> We're doing good. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, <laughs> being on the show tonight everybody's super excited about it i mean our chat's just losing yeah. their mind right now obviously um, um but you know this kind of stems uh you being on because we we connected recently and it's been a minute you know and that kind of happens in life and we sat down and we just started having a conversation it was one of those uh that supposed to be 10 minutes i don't even know how long we were talking yeah i think it was like an hour <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was supposed to be a quick hello and yeah yeah but we started talking about this and you know 
I was surprised to learn and I was very honored that you shared with me, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you're going through. And I think it's always important to just let people know that, hey, me too. I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff that you might not think I am, even though I'm smiling and laughing and uh, living my life that it's still so hard to get through the day sometimes. Um, and yeah. also new process of getting through your own mental illnesses and, and, you know, the things that you're suffering from. So I was so happy to have you on the show to kind of share all that and at least, you know, give maybe a nugget or two here to our audience of something that they could use in their day to day. Yeah, absolutely. I think this, when you were telling me about this show, it, it's such an important thing to talk about. It's such an important thing to normalize and to own and also to set boundaries that are healthy. Maybe you don't want to share everything about what you're going through or you don't want to share everything that's going on, but being able to reach out to someone else and say, oh my gosh, like I go through that too. Or like I do these things too. Like to be able to feel seen and heard and observed really, I think is very important. That's tough, right? I think that's the most that's when you know you've made a connection and a bond in your process of getting better mentally is uh, when you have somebody hear and see you. I think yeah, that harkens absolutely. back to what we've been talking on the show today of, of taking baby steps and how finding a therapist is kind of like dating and really having to find that yeah. right person and fit for you. Um, what's that yeah. process kind of been like for you as far as the thing that clicked and it kind of made you figure it out? Um, so I actually, um, I saw a therapist for the first time in my 20s after going through a really bad breakup. Um, I, it was like one of those relationships where you lose yourself entirely and you become exactly what you think the other person wants you to be. But then when that relationship ends, you actually have no part of yourself left because you've given all those pieces of yourself up. It was one of those. It was very, you know, like... I became the phoenix that I am today from it. I'm very grateful, but um, it was really rough. I was just an anxiety riddled mess. And so I actually went to a divorce counselor who like a friend of mine was seeing and she recommended him and he was wonderful. He was so kind and he pushed me when I needed it. And I learned so much from him. Um, and then, you know, when I moved back to Texas, I obviously stopped seeing him. He was in California when I lived in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I've always been a huge proponent of going to therapy. Everyone can benefit from therapy. I think you don't have to feel like you have, you know, a mental illness or a trauma or something to process. Everybody can benefit from therapy. And um, it was something that I was very like, yes, everybody should do. Um, for me, though, after the break-in... Um, obviously that is a huge trauma and it was something that I knew I needed to get back into. I needed so desperately someone to help me go through all of the things that you go through with PTSD. And so, yeah, the, the whole process of finding somebody who specializes in it or who has experience with it, who knows how to help and how to listen and you know, not be, I feel like therapists are never judgmental, but not be, you know, not push too hard when I didn't need it, but to give me the tools to help myself. And it's, it's been really life changing for me, honestly, like I was very lucky in that I the very first person I met with, I clicked with immediately. Um, I know not everybody is as lucky as I was. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been such a help, honestly, such a huge, huge leg up for me from where I was. I mean, that's awesome to hear, buddy. That makes yeah, me smile. Dude. Yeah, dude. I mean, because like so many people, I feel like a lot of people go to a therapist and they don't have the right chemistry and they're afraid to tell them like, it's just not going to work out. But yes. I know tons of people who have had that. And I was telling my therapist about it. She was like, we, ex we are not going to take it personally. Like no therapist should ever take anything personal that's, they're that's like usually the case go. it's like go we, find someone else we manifest it usually when we come in right yeah like, no we, we bring that weight yeah exactly we bring that weight as like oh i'm rejecting you and they're like no we just don't have the same like for instance my therapist is actually on maternity leave right now and i had to see a different therapist in the meantime I like we get it along and like it's cool, but I'm counting down the days till my original therapist comes back and I have no problems letting my new therapist know like 
it's been real. Bye. Like, I like this it's, other one better. So. It, it's not you. It, it's me. It's um, you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. When you find your person in therapy, whatever that therapy may be, it's that instantaneous bond that you can rely on because correct me if I'm wrong, Meg, but don't tell me that voice isn't inside your head every day when you're getting triggered or when you're going through, you know, a rough time, you start to hear them in your head of like, Hey, oh, Meg, how would I process this right now? Absolutely. Like for me, I've struggled with anxiety my whole life. I've been medicated for it um, on and off. And my therapist, like one of our last sessions before she went on leave, on like maternity leave, um, I was just having like really bad anxiety and I couldn't figure out what it was from. And we were like talking about a bunch of different stuff. And she was like, one of the things that I think that is good to remember, and I like hear her voice and she says it, is sometimes it's best to just say, this is how anxiety feels in my body. And that's okay. It's, it's okay. Like it doesn't feel good right now, but it's not going to feel bad forever. And I think about that exact wording every day every day when something goes like wrong or i feel anxiety for no fucking reason or whatever i think of her saying that like that exact voice of her saying it, it has helped me so much to just acknowledge instead of fighting my anxiety like to be able to acknowledge it and just like sit with it and be okay and to like have the reassurance that it's not going to be forever from someone else is like priceless I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's yeah. what it is. That's what it is, is that if you can go to therapy, you're not going to get that, what you just said necessarily all the time. But if you just get it once, it changes your life. It's changed mine as far as my bipolar, where when I know that I'm being manic, because I can feel it now, I've been, uh, it's taken training to feel it. But I hear my therapist in my head too of like, hey, things are happening right now. There's been a shift in the universe, but we're not going to freak out about it. We're not going to be scared of it. And we're just going to kind of deal with it. Like you said, I'm, a, I'm acknowledging it. But I'm not, I'm not letting you deal with me today. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, like it takes a, there's so much in that little, one little phrase, like the acknowledgement that what you're feeling is real and also that it's okay to feel that way. There's just so much in there that I think helps, right? Like that, you know, I'm not going crazy right. because I feel like I'm having a heart attack out of nowhere and I'm a perfectly healthy, you know, work out, eat mildly okay, third <laughs> woman. Um, yeah, like I'm not losing my mind. I'm just experiencing something that sucks. And same with triggers. Like with my PTSD, like my first few times encountering new triggers, like I just felt like I was losing my fucking mind. Like it was something that like things that I had been able to interact with in the world for forever very suddenly made me feel like I was going to cry and throw up and scream and absolutely go cuckoo bananas. And yeah, like being able to hear that, like, that's okay. Like, hey, that sucks. We sit with it. We acknowledge it. And here's why those things maybe be triggering or here's what we do if we run into those things. Yeah. I think that, I mean, that falls in line with everything we've been talking about today of acknowledgement, ad addressing, seeing, hearing it, and then what you can do afterwards is the things and the steps that you've learned from the people that are helping you. Now I can attack this or I can fix this issue properly. And that's awesome yeah. that you're going through that, man. I, that's so good to hear. Um, and when I heard uh, you tell me that when we were um, having coffee, I was like, oh, we got to get Meg on. Meg has, got, Meg has got to talk to the people and let the people know what's up. And it's so important. I guarantee you people have got something from you tonight, just sharing all that. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing. I really appreciate yeah, that. We all do. Of thank you, Tyler. This is such a, like I told you when we were having coffee, but I think this is such a wonderful, like, venture for you to take on. I think it's such a helpful thing and, and such a wonderful thing. And I love it. I appreciate that, Meg. I love you. It's great. And I'm, I mean, I'm just happy that you could show up for the folks tonight because they were so excited to see you. Um, oh, hell yeah. And I know they're coming away with a different perspective after this, which is great. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, You're not alone. You're not the only one who experiences triggers or anxiety or any like you are not alone. Just take that. Take that if, if you take nothing else. And that's so important because like, you know, we, we, we hear that and we know that it's kind of like a cliche that, right? Like you're not alone, but man, when you hear that and you need it, it really helps. 
Because I like I have had anxiety my whole life. It's been part of my career. Like I've always been really outward, like in talking about my anxiety. But I still feel like when it happens and I'm like, oh, I'm just dying now. I'm like, nobody has ever felt as bad. Nobody like nobody will understand if I tell them I don't feel good right now because I think I'm about to die out of fucking nowhere. And for me, honestly, like the biggest help. I've done so much work with my therapist and on myself, absolutely. But another really huge help for me was having Gavin because I had a partner who, before I was dating Gavin, I had a partner who, whenever I would talk about my anxiety, was like, oh, you're losing your mind. Like, it's all in your head. Yeah. Like, just, like, let it go. I can't believe you're taking your medicine. Like, can't believe you need a pill to be okay. Blah, blah, blah. And I, I felt so alone. Like, it's in your head. Like, snap out of it. Like, I felt like I should be able to snap out of it. But now in Gavin, I have a partner where I'm like, I, I feel like something's wrong. And he's like, let, hey, let me let me listen to your heart. Let me listen to your lungs. You sound great. I'm looking at you. I'm acknowledging that you don't feel well right now, but I'm keeping an eye on you. You don't have to worry about it because I'm going to worry about it for you. And I'm like, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> that SOB, I love that man. He's I a, know. He says hi, man. by the way. <laughs> I love that man. We've been trying to have lunch for five years now. We've never done it. I want to <laughs> I want to do it for at least 15 to where we, yes. every year we say, let's have lunch. On the 15th anniversary, then you have the lunch. That's what we're I think do. that's perfect. Or I can get, or one of us can commit to actually going to lunch, but then the other does not show up at the last second. Right. And I think if it gets too close, one of you has to stand up the other to keep it going. Exactly. Oh, that's too good. But, and Meg, that, I mean, that speaks to another thing. I know I'm like trying to let you go. I'm like sending you out the door. No, yeah, I'm, I'm actually in. totally fine. You don't have to right. like speed it up. No um, it's one of those things you have, you have a partner in that, that can help you. And I feel like going to AA when I did, and so many other people that a sponsor is that person, your therapist can be that person, but it doesn't, it can be anybody. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, absolutely. It, can, it, it doesn't have to be somebody, uh, you know, we had our, our medical professional on earlier and Marcy who talked about that. Like we want you to go the medical route, but if you can have anybody that can do exactly what Gavin does for you in your situation, um, then that is massive to have. And everybody yeah. needs to reach out. It sucks reaching out for help. I'm having to go through a new process right now, and I have to acknowledge things. I have to say things about myself that are positive, and I hate it, Meg. I absolutely hate it. <laughs> what? It drives you, me crazy. I can't do you it. You have so much to be positive about. Oh, even when you say that, I don't like it. And I'm Ellie more... and I talk about how much we like you all the time. Oh, I hate that so much. But I, you no, know, what? I gotta work. I gotta you. work on that. I gotta work on that. We that's, love you. That's the thing. Thank you. I am trying yeah. to accept more love. I love that. Trying to. So we're all, we're all going through, you know. Well, you know, Kelly and I will cram it down your throat whether you want it or not. So. Uh, all love. It's all good. It's all good. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that, Meg. Um, yeah. That's awesome. You know, you are welcome to join this program anytime you want to. I would love to. Thank you. And now get off, get in bed, <laughs> drink your fluids, woman. My fluids. Get your, you get, get your Pita light out there. You got your two Gatorades, you said, your two Powerades ready my, to go. I got my two Powerades that are low sugar, <laughs> zero sugar, actually. Kelly will be so proud. Good job. I got soup. I'm ready to go. All right. You get to bed. Get better. We'll talk to you uh, soon. Okay, buddy? Thank you so much, Tyler. All right, I appreciate I'll see you. it. Later. Bye. Oh, that's good stuff. Chat, what did we think about that? We got through the whole episode. Both interviews worked. The cameras worked. Man, that's good stuff. Meg was amazing. Um, I thought she dropped so many nuggets right there. Um, really also what her therapist said. Man, that's kind of the biggest thing. It's almost like, you know, it's what I was talking about at the top. It's what Marcy's talking about is just admitting and addressing the problem really is the best start for us. No matter where you are in your process, if you're the one with the affliction, if somebody in your family is... If you can just buddy up to that problem and just recognize that it's there, you can start to get a lot of help. And guys, you can't tell me you can't notice that when, when I'm talking about it or Meg is talking about it or Marcy, your faces can't hide it. You light up when you talk about people that are helping you. It's impossible not to do. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I made this show is because I, I want that for everybody, Raspy Water 13. Thank you for following. And... Man, that was so good. Just so glad to have uh, have her on. All right. Um, so that's 
almost it for today's show. I, let me check my clipboard here. I got to make sure we have everything that I needed to talk about. Um, so, um, yes, Meg was fantastic. Thank you, Meg, so much for coming on. Thank you, Marcy, so much for coming on. So before I wrap up the show, um, I wanted to talk to you guys about this. So I don't know if you know, but today, uh, the day that we are shooting this show, which is a Wednesday, it is the 21st of July. This is actually Robin Williams' birthday it is today. He would have been 70 years old. And um, I mean, he was one of my idols. I'm sure that he was your idol. I mean, who doesn't love Robin Williams? Um, and I did not know that when we were putting this first show together. Uh, so it's a little bit serendipitous for me in my own little cheesy, campy way because it doesn't, you know. But um, a lot of his process is something that I've done in my life. Um, so a lot of him goes into this show. If you stick around long enough to watch my channel, you'll see what I mean. Um, and so, you know, you read about the guy and the stories about him off camera, and he was such a helper. And he never wanted anybody to feel any sadness because he knew the extreme depths of it. And he preached all the time how life is fleeting and uh, that if you don't begin today, you're never going to start tomorrow, which is true. And he had this universal energy that all of us have felt in some way. And for us lucky few, we have someone that it, we have someone like that in our lives. And if you haven't, I'm going to tell you without trying to get too emotional that they exist because I want to tell you about one of mine is um, my therapist who I've talked about extensively uh, over the course of my career and I've talked about during this show. Um, she passed away a few weeks ago um, at the age of 44. And uh, to say that I'm not utterly devastated is an understatement. And it's been very difficult to put this show together knowing that she's gone because she was a person who was my pillar. She kept me tethered to this earth. And she is somebody like that who was a universal energy like Robin was. And, um, you know, I'm not doing this to be cheap or for entertainment or act like she sacrificed for the show because she did not sacrifice for the show. Um, she was a loss, a massive loss to me, but more importantly to her family, to her friends. Those are the people that actually lost her and those are the ones that are hurting the most, but I tell you this because if you dare to reach out and get help, there are people like her that can save your life, okay? She saved my life. She gave me the gift of moving forward that I never could have accomplished on my own. She gave me hope when I did not want it. And I say it because you are worth getting the help. So please get it. Please somebody, please find somebody that can begin that search. Give yourself the right to exist because at the very least, you are owed that in this reality. And if you do, your life will be spectacular. Your miracles will be brighter. Your dreams will be more vivid. It will all taste better. So give that to yourself and try and give that to others as my friend did. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about my mom too. My mom is an amazing woman. She's kind of like Leslie Nope, if anybody's ever watched Parks and Rec. And... Um, I was having an existential crisis one day and I was asking her and talking to her about what happens when we leave, what happens when we die, where we go, because I'm so terrified of it just being a black void where nobody's there or your people are scattered and you can't find them. And she said, well, then you'll make it your mission to come find me. And it was such a comforting thing to hear from a mother in the idea that you could search the universe for your loved ones and go on a grand adventure. And I really hope I can do that for my friend. I can't wait to go see her. You know, right now it's kind of like all I want to do is go find her. Because I think that's what you do after you've lost somebody. Um, 
you know, I want to know, does she hear music? Can she still see? Can she taste things? Um, but I'm not done yet. And, you know, I talk about her because she's so much a part of this show. She helped build it. I would not be here if it was not for her. And she helped me go down all these different paths. And at least my last time I got to have with her was beautiful. I don't even remember what we talked about because it's just energy. That's who she was. If anybody was going to make it into the universe, she would be one of them. So circling back to Robin Williams, uh, who has so many great quotes and wisdom, but his best might be the simplest, and I want to leave that with you today. And that is everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind always. And that's it for the episode one. That's the end of the first show. Um, thank you so much for everybody for helping out and being a part of this. Um, if you are watching the recorded version of this show, please know that if you watch live, I will be doing a post show after every episode to recap the day's topics, take questions from viewers, and talk about the coming weeks. I got to get off this episode because um, I need to go deal with some emotions. Uh, but thank you all so much. There's so many people who helped me put this together. Uh, my family, uh, sponsors, um, everybody in the Twitch community, uh, uh, Zavader helping me out today with Nightbots, or Ray and Tina, Eric, Mariel, Meg, Marcy. There's so many different people. Uh, the list is way too long to try and thank everybody. And I thank, I thank my buddy who's not here. But I'm going to... I'm going to find her one day, and that's fine. But while we're still here, the passion is now a mission. We're going to get better. We're going to help other people get better. And that's it for How Are We Today.